Good afternoon, everyone. Okay, today I'm happy to announce that Dr. Rick Batt is here. He's a Sanibel Shell Club member. He started collecting shells when he was five. He's a, prof a geology professor, and I'm going to let him just take it away. Can you hear me? Barely. 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 Okay. Better? Okay. Well, hopefully you can hear me. Thanks for having me here. Uh, so I'm going to talk a bit about shelled cephalopods past and present. Uh, you're familiar with Nautilus, I'm sure, but there are several other kinds out there. So let's uh, take a look at a couple things. As soon as I can. Okay, cephalopods. You've got the typical Nautilus in a phylum mollusca, and uh, we have other mollusks you're familiar with, gastropods, chitons, pedalpacophora, scaphopods, tusk shells, there are a couple other classes in mollusks too that aren't really exciting, so I won't go into monoplacophora, aplacophora, and a couple other placophoras, but these are the main ones we're interested in here. This is uh, modern Nautilus, of course. Okay, you can even see them in aquaria sometime, in big aquariums, like I've seen them in the Chicago Aquarium before. But they do live in deep water, and so they have to have a somewhat pressurized and cooled down tank if you're going to put them in an aquarium. And there's a great book out there by Wolfgang Grüke. Uh, if you've ever seen it, excellent book, good background material. Now, Nautilus. Okay, if you, you may know if you slice one in half, you can see internal details. The living chamber, here's a drawing of it. Living chamber is where the animal hangs out, but then the rest of the... What they call a fragma cone is broken up into chambers by septa, the partitions. And there's a tube going through called the siphuncle. And the siphuncle basically gives the uh, previous chambers contact with water or air. The air is actually pure nitrogen that the animal puts in the chamber sometimes and it can also get some water in there. It's a somewhat porous edge to the siphuncle. So this allows the Nautilus to actually gain neutral buoyancy. So it can hover at a certain depth and not sink and not rise up. It doesn't use this to zoom up hundreds of meters through the water and back down. That takes too long. Okay, if, when they go up during the daytime, they live in deep water like 300 meters deep and they go up in a, on a reef during the day time to go deep, and at night time they come up to feed. Uh, they actually do it under their own power. They have a funnel and they swim, but they stay within a meter at the bottom typically. Okay, well, we'll be coming back to some of the details of this, looking at other things, but in addition to Nautilus, there are ammonites. And ammonites, or ammonoids, I should say, because we'll see that not all ammonoids are ammonites, but another very familiar group, shelled cephalopods, and, oh, come on, wrong one. I'm trying to get to the pointer. There we go. But these are just a few pictures. I've got this specimen up here, and these are weird shaped over here called heteromorphs will come to. This is one I have at home, too. But before we get into ammonites, and I, I do know a bit about ammonites. I did my doctorate on them almost 40 years ago. <laughs> so, and I'll show you a little bit of the kind of stuff I've come up with on that. But, we do have another group of cephalopods living today. So you've got the nautilus today, nautiloids, actually, because now we have two genera we come to. But you also have coleoids living today. And this includes everything else that's alive today, much more advanced. As it turns out, though, ammonites are very close related to coleoids and not close related to nautiloids. That's just a resemblance, basically. But coleoids include things like the spirula. Okay, now it's still a shelled cephalopod, but where's the shell? You don't see, you see the shells wash up on the beaches sometimes. But that's what a spiral animal looks like. Here, the shell is up in this part, as you can see in the cross section. It hangs vertically because the shell has chambers and a siphuncle going up in here. So it can regulate its buoyancy, but the chambers with air are lighter than the animal, so it hangs vertically. It's a strange critter. So similar to a nautiloid, but the shell's inside. Of course, this is, these are cuttlefish. And cuttlefish do have a shell also. You may be familiar with the cuttle bone that people put in bird cages quite often to give birds a, a 
source of calcium. This is a specimen of my collection, quarter for scale. This is a common species, sepia officinalis from the Mediterranean quite often. There are other species of cuttlefish. These are some specimens of my collection too. A separate one, and these have slightly different shapes, especially the one on the right, there are two from China and one other one from the Mediterranean in this picture. You may have eaten cuttlefish, very tasty, if done right. Uh, here's another shelled cephalopod. This type's extinct. This is called a belemnite or belemnoid. And often you may find fossils. Oops, come on, Lee, come on. There we go. I've got to push the right button here. Often you may find fossils like this, especially in places like Delaware. Very common. That's actually the state fossil of the state of Delaware, it is a belemnite, Belemnitella americana. And that's not the main part of the shell, though, as you can see. Well, there's a cartoon of what it looks like here. The shell part, this part, is way in the back. In the cross section here, you can see it back here. It's a counterweight. It's an internal counterweight to help the animal be horizontal. If it had, a, if it had an air-filled shell, it would be just like the cuttlefish, I mean, just like the asparula. And then, of course, you have squid. Do they have a shell? It's inside, but it's called a pen. That's a squid pen, typical one. If you've ever prepared calamari, uh, you have to remove that and also get the beak out of it too. It's kind of crunchy otherwise. But you can see where the pen sits inside. Internal, internalized shell. Now, here's the only other group of cephalopod common today, and these, octopus. Do they have a shell? No, octopus don't have a shell at all. They have a beak, but no shell. Um, but there is a group of octopods that you may be familiar with, Argonaut, paper nautilus. It's not a nautilus, it's in the octopus group. Now is that a shell? You see it as shell stores, it's not a shell. Octopus don't have shells. This is an egg cradle. It's only made by the female, female lays eggs in it. And then when it's done, it leaves behind the eggs after they hatch. The cradle can actually float up on beaches. People find them on beaches all over the place. Here's a picture from a nice old shell book I got way back when it first came out. Seashells of North America by R. Tucker Abbott, the best book still for identifying local shells on both U.S. coasts. And they have a whole page on the common species found here. Now, the specimen I have was from the Philippines. This species is all found in the Mediterranean. It's also found in the Atlantic. Argonaut Arnigo, the common, nautil common paper nautilus. And this is the female. It's got these specialized arms that make this egg cradle. They show a picture here. There's a shot of a live one of a female. The male, this is the male of the species. Now, in the book, you think, oh, the male looks big, but then you got to read the print. The female is eight inches across, it says. The male is half an inch. <laughs> so, a little bit of change, difference in size. You do see that on some critters. There's another example of paper nautilus. There are actually several species of this octopus that the female makes the egg crate, and they do look different. This is the other common one, nodosa, found in the Philippines and other places. These are a few other species in my collection. Uh, the Argonauta hyans is fairly common too. Brown paper nautilus. You've got this weird one from Mozambique, a little bit spinier. You've got Norii, it's rare. You've got Pacificus, which may be the same as the uh, common Argo type, but some people debate it. And then you've got Cornutus from the Gulf of California, West Mexico. So those are the main ones around. I don't know of any other species of Argonaut out there. Okay, so you do have octopus that make egg cradles, not shells. Okay, well, you do have a lot of shells. Where'd cephalopods and other, other mollusks come from? Just since we're looking at them through time, through geologic history, where do they come from? Now, how do you end up with mollusks where you have single shells that are coiled one way, single shells coiled another way, two shells, eight shells? And the old idea, way back when I started paleontology a long time ago, was you start off with a hypothetical ancestral mollusk we're already with the shell. But that made it kind of difficult to get to some of the other shapes, especially mollusks that don't have shells, because there are some of those too. So we have a better idea now. But it's based on things like this. These are the early, some of the earliest mollusk fossils. You know, seashells all came from this type of thing. And pretty worm-like. Uh, the one up top has a single non-mineralized shell, so it made an organic, very thin shell. You find a carbonized thing here. 
no shell at all, something with two weird shells, but <laughs> basically what we think now is you can't start off with something like this. A single worm-like critter has little needle-like spicules of aragonite embedded in its skin, and it gave rise to all the other mollusks. So you didn't start off with the shelled mollusk. You start off with this, and today you've got Aplicophora, it's a class by itself. It's mollusk, it's very similar. Or if you take these little bristles, uh, needle-like spicules of aragonite and put them together, you can make eight plates surrounded by a girdle. You get a chitin. That's where they came from. And if you take this and fuse these together to make one shell over the top, you have monoplicophora. And then take this shell, you get all the other mollusks. You can coil this thing in one plane, you get what's called a Bellerophon, those are common fossils back in Cambrian or Division, Silurian times, a long time ago before me. Uh, if you take this coil and give it torsion, you move it, coil it around in a different way, you get a gastropod, that's where snails came from. You take a monoplicophrin and make it higher, instead of being flat, just make a high conical shell and then start putting septa in it, you get this weird thing here. And then if you add a siphuncle, you get cephalopods. Now if you take the same shell and fold it over, this is actually one shell just folded over, it looks a little like a clam, but it's one shell. Some call it rostroconch, that's a class of mollusks that's extinct, only around in Paleozoic, before the dinosaurs. But if you take rostroconch, that's how you get the other two types of mollusks. You fuse it together on the bottom, make it one tubular shell, you get a tusk shell, scaphopods. Take the same shell, fold it over, and then you don't connect it at the top. You decalcify the top, m make a hinge, now you've got a bivalve. That's where your clams come from. So all from one ancestor. These are some pictures somebody did, kind of artsy pictures of what some of the early cephalopods would have looked like way back in the Cambrian period when they first appeared, based on simple shells that they found that they interpreted to be cephalopod shells. Not exciting, necessarily. Uh, then, when you get into the Ordovician period, uh, we're talking maybe f almost 500 million years ago, more than twice as old as dinosaurs. You had these straight shell cephalopods, really common. These are nautiloid cephalopods. But there were actually several other groups of cephalopods that I'm not going to spend the time talking about. There's actinoceratids, there's endoceratids, a bunch of other things that are in different subclasses like nautiloids. They only lasted a short time. But nautiloid cephalopod, it's a straight shell. They started off straight shelled. And in, in cross-section, it's got the septa, it's got a siphuncle going right down the middle. All you have to do, do is coil that thing around, you get your typical nautilus later on. But what I don't like about this reconstruction on this side is they have the critter horizontal. Now, why wouldn't it be horizontal? Because your shell back here is full of air and the animal's heavier. So these would be vertical, like in this picture. There's a diver for scale there. Now, this one's horizontal here, and that one's okay, even though it's 30 feet long. That would be kind of hard if it was bobbing up and down and it kept on bobbing out of the water 30 feet deep, but um, the reason that one's horizontal is that's one of those other subclasses I don't want to talk about. It's called the endoceratids. The reason they can be horizontal is they have a counterweight inside those chambers. It makes the shell heavier back there, so it can be horizontal, kind of like the belemnites I talked about. Here's a fossil I collected. I didn't bring this one, I did bring a few over there you can look at after, but here's a fossil of a typical straight shell nautilus, nautiloid from Cincinnati, Ohio area, the Ordovician. You just pull up the row cuts out there and you just be able to collect everything. This, one, this one's been replaced by silica, broken in sections, you can see the septa going across, you can see the siphuncle tube going up the middle. These are some I collected in western New York. I taught at Buffalo State College, I did a lot of research on the Devonian fossils there and these are extremely common in some layers. These are nautiloid cephalopods too. And I got a couple of these specimens over here. They started coiling too. That's a, one of the earliest coiled nautiloids. This is from the Ordovician from about 400, 500 million years old almost. And I collected this one near Cincinnati, Ohio too. So called Gyroceros. Here's one from the Devonian. Just south of Buffalo, there's a layer where you can find these things if you know where to look. And I collected this one along the Lake Erie shore once, but you have to go when the tide's really down. It does have a tide on the lake, but the layer is only exposed when the water level is really low. And this one's been piratized a little bit. But this is a nautiloid, pretty good size, 
I got a better picture of one. This one I brought with me, actually. It's pretty good size. It's over on the left on the table when you look. Ballpoint pen for scale, so you're looking at about nine inches across. It's not a Nautilus. Okay, back when it was first discovered and named, it was named Nautilus Magister, but they realized it's not the same as modern Nautilus. Nautilus didn't appear until at least the Cretaceous period when T-Rex was around. These were ancestors, predecessors. Now it's called Nephritocerus Magister. They always make a longer name when they move them too. I don't know why. They're just fun to say, I guess. That's a Euripter down below one of my, I used to do work on those too in research, but sea scorpions. This is what Buffalo would have looked like back when that Nephritocerus was around. A friend of mine did this picture, Buffalo Geological Society. I used to belong to that group and did a lot of talks for him. But here you've got the Nephritocerus over here, swimming away from Dunkleosseus. That's the uh, large predatory fish that they had back then. Sharks were small, about four feet long. This guy was 20 feet long. It was a little more primitive. Had heavy armor on the head. Okay, moving along, you do have nautiloids in the Mesozoic too, and I collected a few in the Cretaceous. Uh, looks much more like modern one. This one's called Paris Clematoceros on the left. I brought that specimen here. Clematoceros on the right. I collected these in Texas. And they're looking a lot more like modern Nautilus. This is called Cymatoceros. This one's a specimen from Madagascar, not in my collection, just a picture from the website. But it shows you something. You can see here, uh, up in this brown part, you can see the septa, you can see the partitions. You only see those partitions if the shell's been removed. When you see a fossil with the shell removed, then you might see the sutures, they call them, the partitions. The septa intersect the inside of the shell, and that's called a suture line. So you see these suture lines. If the shell's still present, you're not going to see those. So in this specimen, they polished off the piece with the back here, showing the sutures. This is the actual shell itself from the Cretaceous period. It's still pearly. You can still find pearly fossils with the original shell. No change since the Cretaceous. Same crystal structure inside. Okay, but in this one also, you can kind of see these lines. Those aren't the septa, then. Those aren't the partition lines, the sutures. Those are ornaments. Some nautiloids had ornament on them. Like on this specimen, I've got this specimen here. This is a Cymatoceros from Madagascar, and those are grooves. That's the ornament, those aren't the partitions. We actually had nautiloids in Florida. I wish I had a specimen, I don't have one, but this is one called Atoria. It's from the Oligocene from about 40 million years ago or so, 30 to 40 million years ago, living here in southern Florida. So specimens have been found in some of the rocks. But so nautiloids lived here. They're actually very abundant in the Mississippi Valley area back then, but then they became extinct everywhere except the Western Pacific. So that's an Aturia. That's a, the model is in the uh, museum at Gainesville. Okay, if you move on to ammonites, ammonoids, I should say, here's a comparison my colleague Peter Ward came up with, one of his papers back when I was working on my doctorate. Uh, you look at a nautilus in cross section, you can see those partitions, the septa. You can see the siphuncle, you can see the chambers, body chamber where the animal lived. In an ammonite, ammonoid, this one is actually an ammonite too, you can see the partitions, but they look more complex, something different to them. And the siphuncle actually goes along just inside the shell, it's not down the middle. Another difference is the shell on a nautilus, you know how fragile these things are, you drop one, it's going to break. The shell on an ammonite or ammonoid was only half as thick, very, very thin. Uh, a couple of my colleagues suggest it could have even been somewhat flexible. Very thin and very lightweight. These are a couple examples of ammonoids. I better start saying it right, ammonoids from the Paleozoic. It's from the Paleozoic era before about 240 million years ago. They're ammonoids, not ammonites. There's a big difference. Ammonoids is a group. Ammonites is a type of ammonoid. These are from the Devonian that I collected in western New York. You can see the suture lines here with a partition, so this is an internal mold. Not very exciting, not very big. There were some larger ones, but I didn't have any luck. This picture shows some of the differences between a nautiloid here with the sutures that are straight, and then you've got these three things. These are all ammonoids, and you look at the Devonian or any other Paleozoic ones, they have what they call goniotitic, simple folded suture lines. This is one fold. You look at the Cretaceous, I mean, Triassic ones, late Permian Triassic, wavy, but not very complex. That's called a serotitic suture. It's still an ammonoid. 
real ammonites only from the Jurassic and Cretaceous period. And that's where you got these crazy sutures, it says here, but really intricate patterns. So the latest of the uh, cephalopod, of the ammonoids. That's just an example of a goniotitic one. You can see the sutures, this one's from Morocco, been polished. Very common in rock shops and stuff, and then straight nautiloids and so on from the Devonian period. Here's an example of a serotitic suture. Very simple, lobes and saddles, but just curves. And then you get into the ammonitic ones. This picture from the website, but anyways, you can take one of these sutures, and what they like to do is from here to there draw a picture showing the detail. And that's what the suture line looks like. That's actually what the partition looks like where it hits the shell wall, very intricately folded. And there's a reason for it. The shell's really thin. You're going to need a lot of support, especially if you go deep. You don't want the shell to cave in or implode on you. So the way to do it, partly, is to have these intricate sutures, intricate septa folds right close to the edge. Now, if you take that same ammonite and slice it in half, I've got the specimen, didn't bring it, but what you notice is those intricate sutures, here's what the septum looks like in half, just a couple little wiggles. Same ammonite. It gets more complex as you get towards the outside. And you can see that in this specimen I collected in uh, Utah once doing some of my research. This is a cross section of a piece of an ammonite showing one septum, one partition. It's pretty simple here. It just goes in there and out there. But as you come towards the edge, it folds more and more. So if you look at the edge of this fossil, here I traced out one of the sutures. So intricate, but more intricate as you get towards the edge. Gives you more support. Just like flying buttresses and other supports in cathedrals. Same basic principle to keep walls from caving in. If you're an ammonite and you go down to deep water, you need to have intricate support, or else your thin shell is going to collapse. I'm on the topic of ammonite, something called amylite you may have heard of. A lot of people into gems like amylite. So it was a fad for a while. Comes from ammonite fossils. Uh, what is it? Here's this nice color you get to it. Here's another specimen, but you find these nice things. Very expensive gems. This spe specimens come from Alberta with these amylite. That's the original shell. That's aragonite, actually. With impurities. Little trace of this, little trace of that. That's all it is. How thick is it? They make gems out of this. Very paper thin. In order to make a gem out of it, you've got to add some support to the backing of it. And very, very soft, too. Calcite soft, you can scratch with a nail. So it's not really the best gem. But it's very popular. We did a cruise to Alaska after we drove up there from here what, several years ago and then did a cruise. They stopped at a lot of places like Skagway, Juno. This is in Skagway. All the gem stores have ammonites on display because of the amylite. <laughs> Store owner, wanted, manager wanted to sell me the specimen, but I wasn't going to fork over $25,000 for a specimen. <laughs> I think it was more than that, actually. But no thanks. So here's a typical ammonite, little giant clam back there that's 23 inches, but here's a typical ammonite from uh, Madagascar. I bought at a rock shop in Utah once, but uh, it's about 17 inches across. That's a Jurassic example. And Jurassic ammonites, once they came around when brontosaurus and some of those dinosaurs were around, uh, often are open coiled like this. We can see all the earlier parts. You get into the Cretaceous period, the last uh, period that ammonites were around before they mysteriously became extinct. Uh, you have a good variety. It's not just one simple coil. A lot of them are closed like this. You can't see the coil inside. You get a lot of weird shapes. That's where you get your heteromorphs mainly, odd shapes. This is what Denver would have looked like back during the Cretaceous period. I did my doctorate in Boulder, Colorado, so not far from there. This would have been Denver. No Rocky Mountains back then. This was 200 meters below sea level on the bottom of the seafloor. Not ocean, but the continent had subsided there. There were mountains way out to the west in Utah at the time. But you have these are long, straight ammonites and a coiled one. Just to show you what it's like maybe collect a couple, I did a talk for COA several years ago at San Antonio on ammonites, and somebody there uh, introduced us, Robin and me, to a friend they had, or a relative actually, up north of Dallas. And we stopped on our way home, and he took us out collecting along Lake Texoma. They dammed the Red River between Texas and Oklahoma and they made this lake. The southern shore of it, there are places where you get this, these bluffs. And great place for ammonites, Cretaceous ones. Sometimes just walking along, this was there, one up here, one down here. Uh, it, pickings were really good at one, at one time. We were there about five times and you can see how it's getting 
harder and harder to find stuff, but this is our first time there. And to get there, we had to hike two miles on a dirt path, up and down. Sometimes everything would fall off. You know, our wives helped push once in a while, but uh, we, Barry and I pulled a thing, and we did that a couple of years when he had a friend who had a place we could park. But that became inaccessible for after a while, so the last few times we were there, it was a boat. He had a friend who had a boat. It was a 45-minute boat ride. He dropped us off. We waited in. And he said, I'll be back in a couple hours. So he had to believe he was going to be back. But in picking, with, it was, we got in a rainstorm one of these times. I think that's when it came back at the end of a rainstorm. That's just the last time we were there. Those are a few of the ammonites that we picked up. Robin and me, and we had a couple piles like that. We filled up the boat pretty much. It didn't sink. <laughs> and the other place that was good collecting, uh, we had a friend who had permission to go onto a ranch, a private ranch up in Texas, north of Dallas. Doesn't look like you're going to find many fossils there until you walk along and you find areas where it's eroded out and the ammonites are just laying there. But they're exposed and they're broken in pieces. So just like what you're going to find. Basically take a beer flat and take all the pieces you can and hope you can use Elmer's glue and put them together afterwards. This was the last time we were there. Well, one of the last times we were there, this is what we brought back. It was in our garage. I had to prep it all out because you can see these... Oops, where are they? I'm going the other way. Nope. You can see the big ones back here. They needed to be cleaned out. The center parts of them had rock in them still. Had to use a little hammer and chisel on those. All these ones from that other place broken in pieces. Elmer's glue, clay filling in some of the gaps and stuff, but it worked. So here's what you end up with. These are a few I prepped, and a couple of these are actually, I think, door prizes. But, and the big ones that didn't fit in the, in the house, they're in the garden. They're not as good. These ones aren't as good, so I've got a little ammonite alcohol. Somebody threw that statue on the curb down the street, so. I spend most of my time in the garden these days. Uh, these are some of the other ones from the same place. A genus called uh, Mortoniceros, several species. I've got a couple specimens over there. Hard to identify though. Uh, then you get the big ones. Well, that's a Mortoniceros, larger one. That's my biggest, nicest Mortoniceros, about 18 inches across from that second place. That one came up in actually just two pieces. You can't tell where I glued it together, but it's glued. Then you have the other main type called Eopachydiscus found there, the big ones. and. I should show you on this one, you can see all the suture lines. These are suture lines, those complex things, all the way up to here. So that means that this is not the end of the shell. The part the animal hung out in would go another two-thirds of the way around. That's, a, that's another one from there with ribs. Some of them had ribs. That's my biggest one that we hauled out when we had to do the uh, two-mile hike. And that one's, I cleaned it out. It only weighs 85 pounds now, but it was tw it's 20 inches across. It weighed about 100 pounds taking it out of there. And I'm not as young as that anymore. <laughs> but you think it weighs 85 pounds now. How much would the shell have weighed when the animal was alive? Paper thin, two pounds, maybe, if that. How big did they get? This is the biggest ammonite. Uh, this is actually a replica. This one's, there's replicas in the Los Angeles Museum of Natural History. Uh, I've seen the exact same one in the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto. It's from Germany. My wife for scale. So they got to be almost eight feet across. Wow. Then you get the heteromorphs, the weird ones. Those are all ammonites. They're not snails. Great book, again, by Wolfgang Grücke on heteromorphs. Second book he came out with like this. Nice coffee table book. Great pictures. Great information. These are a few examples of heteromorphs. Not snails. Even this thing. It's got septa. It's got partitions. It's got chambers. It's got a siphuncle. You know, it's an ammonite. They just went crazy. There's one that's shaped like a pretzel here. <laughs> Some people had fun doing interpretations of what they may have looked like. Some of these heteromorphs. These are a couple in my collection. I didn't bring them. I actually found this one. This one's from uh, Morocco, Cretaceous, but I found it in a little flea market up in Anchorage, Alaska on our last trip up there. So I got it for steel too, but... And then this one I bought from Donald Dan at, this, at the uh, Santa Bell show a few years ago. He has some neat ammonites. And this one's one of the heteromorphs. And it's weird because the same species, this one coils to the right, this one coils to the left. 
and it's about 50-50 for that species. Okay, well, as I said, I did my research on ammonites. I don't want to spend too much time on it, but I did my research on ammonites, and uh, I went to the University of Colorado and started in 1982 there. Uh, went to my professor, Earl Kaufman, who used to be at the Smithsonian. He was a big name there, and then he ended up at Colorado, and he worked in paleo and strat, so sugar feet, and he wanted me to work on ammonites. I shouldn't know, didn't know what I was getting into. Didn't know much about them, but he was interested in using ammonites to interpret environment. Ammonites have been used for a long time, since the mid-1800s, ammonites have been used to date rock, good index fossils. But they were never thought to be useful in environmental interpretations. You know, there's a field called paleoecology, where you can look at fossils and a the rock they're found in and interpret what the environment was like. Well, ammonites were never, almost never used for that because one problem, modern nautilus, which ammonites are similar to, so they figured they were about the same. Modern nautilus, when the shell is empty, what does, what does it supposedly do? It raises, rises up to the sea surface because it's full of air, and it drifts along. Wherever it settles may not be where it lives. At least that's what they thought. Now they found out that they don't really drift that much. But back then, that was a big thing. And so with ammonites, they said, well, the shell's similar. It didn't fill with air. You can't use it for environmental interpretation. Earl Calvin thought, well, maybe you can. And when I started my work in 1982, there were only four papers done on using ammonites for paleoenvironmental interpretations. Only four. A lot of papers on everything else, but only four. And those papers weren't that uh, significant. But other people did some studies of ammonites, but their studies weren't related to interpreting environments. Their studies were more like, look at the individual animal. How did it live? Don't worry about the environment. So. This paper by my colleague John Chamberlain uh, basically shows, he looked at the floating orientations of these things with the chambered part in white and the part with the animal lived in in dark. And he looked at the center of mass and center of buoyancy and tried to figure out how fast they could go and how, how well they could swim with that funnel that they went backward like Nautilus. Some of them could swim pretty well, maybe uh, just like Nautilus, about 30 centimeters a second, about a foot a second, and they can go about that fast. But some of these ammonites, like down at the bottom, this one over here, center mass and center buoyancy in the same place, if it would have tried to swim backward with its, with its uh, using its funnel, it would have just spun in place like a pinwheel. Oh my goodness. Sorry about that. Well, this is one of the four papers that was done trying to interpret environment using ammonite fossils. This was by Scott back in 1940. Uh, another one was by my advisor, and another one was by uh, Tanabe in Japan, and then there were two short papers by the same person in Germany, uh, Bernard Ziegler, and I had to read the papers in German. That was fun. Scientific journal papers in German. But, so I got tasked with trying to figure out a way to see, well, can ammonites, once and for all, can they be used to interpret environment? So my thesis, my dissertation worked on focusing on one area, a big area. This is North America. During the Cretaceous period, sea level was high sometimes, dividing it infectiously into two land masses. You had this western interior sea that came through. It was about 200 meters deep, 600, 700 feet deep. And ammonites were all over the place. They came in from the south, some came in from the north. So I was looking at this western interior sea. And the goal was to look at ammonite fossils collected there. Thankfully, I didn't have to collect them all myself. I collected a few, but I could look at specimens somewhere else, like USGS in Denver. And plot the distribution of the ammonites and see if there's any relation to environment. But n not just at one single uh, time stamp. Basically, I looked at a 10 million year interval over that whole sea. And uh, starting off, uh, during 10 million years, you can deposit a whole sequence of rock. This is an example, it's a cycle. Sea level went up, here's coal, sand on the beach, getting deeper and deeper, carbonates offshore, 100 meters, 200 meters deep, and then sea level went down, and you go back to the beach. So that's an example of a greenhorn cyclothem. It's called, I had to look at ammonites from that whole thing throughout the whole sea, and I ended up measuring 7,000 some specimens at the United States Geological Survey. And the guy in charge of that survey was Bill Cobbin. He was also on my committee. Bill Cobbin was affectionately known as Mr. Ammonite. He just passed away a couple years ago at 98 years old, still going in the field. But he was the world expert on ammonites at the time, and he did not believe you could use ammonites to interpret environment. 
So he did not believe in the work I was doing. I had to convince him to get my doctorate. I got my doctorate, so. Well, what I ended up doing was I could have plotted distribution of different species, but we found out that species of ammonites taxonomy, you can have five different species with the same shell shape. Or you can have one species with two or three or four different shell shapes. So shape was something that was more important. So I had to come up with a classification. I looked at the shape, the morphotypes, and I came up with a simple classification. So it's looking at the shell. Can you see the coil or not? And is it compressed or wider? And what's the ornament like? The heteromorphs, I didn't have too many. I just kind of grouped them like that. And then I plotted maps of those 7,000 specimens. I assigned them to morphotypes first. I did all sorts of calculations. If you ever heard of Rob's parameters, I did all these calculations for each one to put them in morphotypes. And then I plotted the distribution of each specimen on a map. I had 700, 700 and, no, I had 100, 150 pages of maps in my thesis. I had a 750 page thesis. Wow. Two volume. It came out, I had like 18 morphotypes in the end when I finally did a publication on this stuff. I had three publications off of that thesis. I condensed it down to 18 morphotypes. I originally had 52, and I plotted maps of all of them. Here's just one, just a couple examples. This is a map showing the seaway, and let's see over here, you've got Utah, Colorado's over here, Texas is down here, Montana's up there. This is the western shore, that's the eastern shore over there. This is during a time of high sea level, during that middle part where sea level was highest, and the dots, which you can barely see over here and over near the coast over here, are where this type of ammonite was from, a uh, smooth compressed dish shape one. Turns out, if it drifted around when it died, why don't you find the remains in the center part of the sea? It's only found close to shore. Interpretation is it lived close to shore, it lived close to the bottom, it didn't go swimming all over the place. Here's another one that, this time the sea is a little bit narrower, this is earlier in the cycle, but here's the western coast in western Colorado, western Utah, Western Utah, I mean, over here in eastern Colorado, you've got the eastern coast. This heavily nodose one, pretty common form, only found close to shore, except the Black Hills, but they were really shallow at the time. It was an uplift. So this shape was one that would be a good indication of living close to shore. If you found the fossils of these, you know what the water depth was, less than 50 meters, basically. Excepting I ran into a little snag with the same shell shape when I looked at highest sea level and 200 meters deep, and I found specimens in the middle here. Another colleague named Peter Ward, you may have heard of him, he wrote a bunch of books, Finding an Autolus and stuff, Call of Distant Mammoth, all this, state paleontologist in Utah, I mean, in Oregon, uh, at the time. He's the world expert on Nautilus. He's named a lot of things, and named species and stuff, but he was there and said, you got a problem. So I sat there after he talked to me, and I finally figured it out. You gotta look at, in addition to the shape, the septa. The, these squiggly lines on this specimen, if you go from here to here, a squiggly line you can draw out. I started looking and noticed that some of them looked longer and hot, lower than some of the other ones. I came up with a ratio. I got a publication on this one, Sutural Amplitude Index. If you measure the height of one of these lines and the distance across, make a ratio out of it, uh, you find out that for one shape, if these were all the same shape, the ammonites, shallow water ones had low sutures, deep water ones had high sutures. It has to do with folding, to give it greater support inside at greater depth where pressure is higher. And then it worked. Everything came together. Here's another example. This one is a common coiled one. You find these in the Jurassic all over the place, Jurassic period before the Cretaceous. Cretaceous time to open coiled ones with fine ribs. They're found pretty much all over the place. But they're found all over the place in the sea, even when the bottom at 200 meters deep or so was low oxygen. They couldn't survive. And that tells you these guys lived floating. They didn't stay close to the bottom. They lived floating up in the upper part of the water. So I had this little cartoon that was in my thesis and I've modified it a bit and somebody took it and used it in a paleo textbook once, didn't ask, but I, didn't, I don't care. But showing the different shapes and some living deep, some living shallow, and some living up, floating higher up like this, not close to the bottom, and these weird heteromorphs actually being fairly deep water. I even found out that at times the bottom of the sea became anoxic, no oxygen. Think of red tide here, uh, but in this case, this was over thousands, hundreds, tens of thousands of years where the anoxic conditions would flood into the sea, sometimes not affecting the bottom. So you have these bottom dwellers here, but then 
anoxic conditions would rise up. The top of it would be up here, like some of the red tides we've had, when it gets to within 10 meters of the Gulf, uh, 10 feet of the Gulf level, or even 10 inches a couple years ago. And everything built down here dies because it's anoxic. Well, think of it in scale thousands of years. So if there's no oxygen problem, you got all these living in, found in the same layer as fossils. Anoxic layer, you find these middle ones, upper ones, but not the deep ones, not the bottom ones. And then sometimes it went up to within a few meters of the sea level. So that's oil companies like that stuff. To finish off, just look at our modern one, another example, modern Nautilus, because you're familiar with that one. How many of you have seen the difference in the shells? Some are wider than others. The male one's considered to be the one on the left, has an extra appendage. And the female on the right, that's the same species. And when they hatch, this is what they look like. They come out of the egg like this, with the shell. <laughs> Unlike ammonites, ammonites are more closely related to squid. Ammonites, when they hatched, they were planktonic little things. Nautilus comes out with a good sized shell already. Then when it starts to grow, it adds to this, and here's one started to grow. See what's labeled the nepionic constriction there. So the embryonic shell is up to that point, and all this stuff here is new stuff, new shell. And then it keeps on coiling around. My smallest specimen from New Caledonia, you can see the nepionic constriction right there. So the change. And as they grow, you've seen this before, you find nautilus that are the stripes all the way to the end here. That's a juvenile. When they get bigger, they have a white part on the bottom. So you know it's an adult if it's got the white on the bottom, even if it's small, but if it has stripes, it's a juvenile. This has to do with where it lived. Peter Ward figured this out a long time ago. The juveniles lived hidden, camouflaged, basically with seaweed and other stuff sticking up from the bottom. So whether a predator wanted to be looked from the bottom or top, it broke up the outline. Modern Nautilus can go down to 300 meters or more. And when it's down there, no seaweed, but a predator wanted to be looking up, the white, it just blends right in with the water, won't see it. You do get some different forms, different color freaks, you could call them, of Nautilus. You do occasionally get the brown ones. That's a brown specimen. It's not a periostrum, it's not the organic coating, that's the color of the shell. Uh, that one kind of had a bad day somewhere, it kind of made a little curve, <laughs> forgot what it was doing. You do occasionally get albinos. That's my albino specimen. I didn't want to bring it because those are too pricey anymore. Can't get them. So no color at all. You get a lot of Nautilus shells out there. These are in my collection. A lot of different shapes, some color patterns, different sizes for the adults. Uh, some over here are totally different. How many species are there? Well, you've got Nautilus pompilius. That's the one that was named by Linnaeus back in 1758. Found in the Philippines commonly, but also a few other places. And typical size one. This one is a subspecies called Suluensis. It's an adult, but it's only four inches or so, as opposed to seven inches or eight inches. This one down here is a lot bigger. It's about nine inches from Australia. One difference you can see is it's got white in here. The stripes don't make it all the way to the center. Now, is that enough to call it a different species? Some people think yes. Some people think no. Here's, here are a couple examples that have been named as different species. Instead of being Nautilus pompilius, somebody named this thing Nautilus rupertus. The stripes don't come to the end. This is from Indonesia. So the Indonesian specimens were named rupertus, and they're big, nine inches or nine to ten inches. There's Biloensis, named by one of Peter Ward's colleagues. Gets to be nine or ten inches. And it looks like rupertus, but they call it a different species. It's from Palau, different area. And... Uh, Here's one I don't have in my collection. I'm still looking for one. Synophilus, they called it. Uh, some differences. The stripes don't make it to the center. It's also perforate here. It's got a hole. You can look through it. The closest I came is this specimen I've got. They're found in northeast and most Australia. Uh, this is close lab, maybe a hybrid because regular Nautilus are found with it. It's got the perforation, but it, the stripes aren't right, of course. And this one was just named a few years ago by Peter Ward and some other people called Vidiensis from Fiji. I happen to have a specimen. I bought it a few years before it was named from Don Pizer. And he said, well, maybe it'll end up being a new species. Sure enough, a couple years after that, it was, it was named. But it's from Fiji. It doesn't look any different, really, from the others. You do have this guy. I'd say this is definitely different. Not all the smack from fellas. And you can, see a, you, you can see the coil in the center, which you can't see in regular Nautilus. You can see a little bit of the coil. 
and also the interesting pattern on the stripes. That's a different species found in New Caledonia, somewhere east of Australia. And then there's this guy. Well, it's now a genus. Used to all be genus Nautilus. This used to be called Nautilus crubiculatus. Peter Ward and Saunders, years ago, uh, actually the year I finished my doctorate, 1987, named this Allonautilus as a different genus. I got a specimen here, straight-sided shell, an open coil, different genus, it's not Nautilus. So you have two living genera of Nautilus, of Nautilus and Allonautilus. It's also different that Allonautilus has a periostrichum, has an organic coating on the shell. There are two forms, used to be named two different species, Allonautilus scrubiculatus from Solomon Islands and Allonautilus perforatus from Bali, Indonesia. They are different. They look different, but I wouldn't call them necessarily species, but you can see the different patterns here. And you can also see on this guy, barely, it's got ribs. It's got raised ridges, which you don't find in any other Nautilus. In Guruka's, Wolfgang Guruka's book, he's got a picture showing the distribution of different, of the so-called species of Nautilus here. I won't go through them all, but this one may have been due to drift, but all these, this is where they're found, Western Pacific. He's got different species names for them. I did a display for the Sanibel Shell Club a few years ago on Nautilus, and I wanted to tackle how many species there really are. So I looked at, I listed all the species that have been named, Pompilius, and Biloensis, Rupertus, Denomphilus, Vidiensis, Macromphalus, and two Allonautilus species. And I looked at what worms say. If you're familiar with the world, uh, register of marine species. Some people consider that to be the be all and end all expert on taxonomy. Not really. Uh, I found a lot of errors, but the people who put worms together, they choose somebody to be in charge of a certain group of critters, and they're considered the expert. I know experts who say otherwise for this and for tritons, trumpets even, and other things. So, you know, it's a good idea, but worms recognizes Pompilius, they recognize Bielorensis as a species. Rupertus, they don't even have any record of. Stenophilus, they recognize that as a species, and so on. But if you look at the shell, well, at first I said as a subspecies, I'd call them different subspecies personally, like Pompilius biloensis and Pompilius rupertus, if you want to call them something different. Because if you look at the shell itself, there's not really any difference in the shell itself for any of these up here. It all should be Pompilius. Um, I found an article on, tax on the uh, DNA. You know, DNA is the big thing on species. Everybody says, oh, you can tell a species apart, the DNA is different. Peter Ward was one of the people who actually named a lot of species, but then he did DNA and publication came out a few years ago. DNA shows you there's no difference between these. They're all the same. So, so who knows how many there are. And I was in an Nautilus a while ago, you know, seven years old, and the picture on the left is, no, that's seven. I had an Nautilus back then. Uh, Fifty years later, that's still a few years ago, still an Nautilus. I started collecting when I was five, this was mentioned before, and the labels here are actually in genus and species. I was doing Latin by the time I was six. I realized you had to go to Latin names. So that's what I had to share. Thank you. Are there any questions for Rick? Haul it all back. What the big the fossils? Right. Did you have some sort of do you make some sort of a conveyor or something? That's a lot of rock. We used the dolly to carry that stuff about two miles on the trail. And I was at the site, that big site, uh, five times. So each time we bring back some. Uh, the last three times we had a boat, so we he'd bring the boat up, you could walk about twenty feet to well, the water. He was happy to see you. Take it back to the boat, <laughs> and then I had three caches the last time. But yeah. I've, and my biggest ones, I can't carry them anymore. I'm not going to try. So, any other? Yeah. When did they, or why did they start to curl? Uh, I don't know why they started to curl. You start off with the straight nautiloids, and they did start to curl fairly early. Just basically some genetic thing where it became easier to com take that shape, that size, and coil it around in a smaller space. That may give you mobility, too. The shell wasn't sticking straight up. Right. You could actually now swim. And that was probably a good thing. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Okay, so when you brought those back with you from your fossil research, and you said you had to clean them up, how difficult is that? Uh, cleaning them up.
warm up is a pain. <laughs> and I have a Dremel, but a Dremel is not going to do anything because the rock is the same hardness as the fossil. So you've got to know when to quit. So the big ones, like the big one over here, I have to clean out with a hammer and chisel, a little tiny chisel, sit the thing on a pillow on my lap in the garage and tap away. Drove the neighbors crazy probably because I was tapping them, a lot of them open. But, uh, and the other ones, I'd have to clean out too with a hammer and chisel and then glue them back together. Elmer's glue works and if they, if they break, then Elmer's glue and sometimes you break pieces off, you can't replace so they get thin when you get in the centers and that's where clay comes in as you'll see, I think. Yeah. Where did you live when you were six years old that you were finding? Uh, I was buying. And, well, I was five years, when I was five, I was in near Buffalo, New York, near Niagara Falls, Buffalo area. Grew up there, no beaches, no shells at least. Lake Erie, not gonna find good shells. Grandparents sent me uh, some souvenir shells they bought, and they came down to St. Bell, but they went to a shell store and bought some Philippine shells and sent me a basket of Philippine shells. And I started identifying when I was five. I was a weird kid. And that year I got uh, Art Tucker Abbott, Seashells of the World, fresh off the press that same year, first edition. My father gave it to me. I started identifying them. And then I had another book and I looked and said, how come it's called Queen Conch here and Pink Conch here? And then I decided, well, look at the genus and species. So I started doing that. But I collected shells, but the only way I could get shells was mail order, or once a year, my parents would go to a beach in Delaware. We'd go down to Dewey Beach in Delaware, near Rehoboth, and it used to be a fantastic shell store. I'd save up my allowance all year, to blow it all in one night. <laughs> fantastic specimen shell store. But that's about it. Didn't get to Sanibel until the uh, well, first time back in the uh, late 80s. I came a couple times, but then not till we started coming here about 2001. Yes. I was told recently um, at the Sanibel show mm -hmm. that the Nautiluses are going to be harder to get or because of the cyclone that was present, I guess, last year or the year that before be. in Puerto Rico. Hmm. So it's going to be real hard to find them. But how deep is the present day Nautilus found? Uh, modern Nautilus, which live in the yeah. Western Pacific, they, oh, right. they're different from the fossil ones. The fossil ones were shallow. Like, this guy lived in water 20 meters deep or so, maybe at the most, 10 meters deep. Uh, but modern Nautilus, they can come up to the reefs at night to feed when there's no predators looking for them at night. And they'll feed in shallow enough water. You can actually probably wade out the same depth. But during the day, they use their funnels and they actually go down, down to a couple hundred meters, 300 meters or so, and they're fine. So about 700 feet deep. Peter Ward, who was made Mr. Nautilus back then, did a lot of studies on Nautilus. He put modern Nautilus in cages and lowered them deeper and deeper until they imploded. Oh. Couple, he only did it a couple of times, but he wanted to get an idea when, how deep they could go. And they actually maintained a safety margin between 300 and 400 meters where they imploded. They stayed up above 300 meters. But the pressure can increase it as you go down. So it was a good research. He only had to do it once, I guess, so he's, he's not somebody who's going to do that all the time. I know him. All right, thank you, Rick. I'll let you get situated behind the table.